Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hi, and welcome back to Journey Forward with Jory Rose. I am so honored to be sharing the time and space with today with Orlando Bowen, who I met a few months back at a conference. And as soon as I met, not only was he dressed really like amazing and spiffy and to have just like the best wardrobe of any other, you know, man in the room, I just have to give you that little shout out. Um, some awesome sports coach, but um, I, you know, once we got to talking was so incredibly inspired by his journey and talk about the ultimate journey forward. And so I was really looking forward to having him on as a guest. So please, Orlando, introduce yourself and tell our listeners. Um, I know we have, there's a big story that you want to share of the power of forgiveness, but let's just jump right in. Yeah. Awesome. Jory, thank you so much. Um, when you talk about a, uh, a radiant uh, individual and a radiant spirit, you brought that to the, uh, to the thank end. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to, first of all, thank you for that. And, and for the listeners, I don't know, if you have, have you ever walked into a room where you don't really know folks and you're looking for folks who have really positive energy? And you look over and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I could hang out with her. Yeah, you're, you're one of those. So uh-huh. I, I would assume that uh, the listener is being guilty by association with <laughs> of that similar bend to them. So thank you for uh, listening today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really blessed to, you know, be on this life journey that, that, that I've been on, that we've been on as a family. Um, you know, I... Uh, I uh, was born in Jamaica. I, I came to North America when I was really young, three years old. I can still detect a little awesome Jamaican you know, accent I can, there. <laughs> you know, I, can, I can pull it out anytime you want. So just let me know. You know. <laughs> yeah, so let me know, and I could pull it out if, if you're so inclined. But, um, you know, our family moved to North America um, when I was three. Um, my parents now live in Tampa, but I grew up in Toronto, Canada. And, uh, you know, as new immigrants, it's, it's a journey, right? So, it is. Um, you know, they didn't have much in terms of materialistic things, but they had an incredible work ethic mm-hmm. and an insatiable desire to have their kids do better than, than they did. My apologies for that. No worries. Um, so, um, that's... Uh, well, and that's, yeah, I think, so much of an intention of any immigrant, right, is to yes. to work hard and to provide and to give back what, you know, you want for your kids to be able to grow up with. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, they were on the grind trying to do what they could to provide opportunities um, that they that they never had. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, I, growing up, I didn't actually end up spending a lot of time with my parents, mm-hmm. say, mostly on the weekends, but during the week. Um, my, you know, my dad was working multiple jobs. My mom was going to school full time, working full time. Um, so I spent a lot more time at my grandparents place. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they also as new immigrants were, you know, very big on gratitude. So you talk Mm -hmm. about journey forward and, and, um, you know, also being present and being grateful for the things that you have. Right. So one thing they always say was um no matter where you go no matter what happens you know if if you go someplace and and somebody puts something on your plate they welcome you into their home they put something on on your plate always be so grateful Mm. and thankful and don't ask for any more Mm. um because the reality was that as as new immigrants and being connected to other new immigrants what they were putting on our plate was sometimes more than they had to eat mm. um, when we left or yeah. when we leave, right? So, you know, just sacrifices uh, for the betterment and growth of everyone. Um, another Sounds thing like they- you got some really, really rich and beautiful mindsets and experiences of, of growing up, that, that foundation and what you learned it from such a young age. 
Yeah, Joria. And uh, you know what's interesting about that is that you kind of, when they say things, it doesn't really, or at a time, it's just like, why are you saying that? Of course we're going to say thank you and be grateful. But you didn't, we didn't understand where it was coming from. Yeah. And it was just, this is the expectation. This is how we show up. This is how we're expected to, sh- to show up. But it, there was such a uh, deep meaning to it because there were times that we as kids were, had an opportunity to eat and, and the adults didn't. Mm. We didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Um, wow. but, uh, you talk about, you know, sacrifices. Um, you know, they, they went through so many things just so that we could have a chance. And again, it's, it's what you do with that chance. Right. So as you're experiencing life, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be challenges. But if you understand that there are folks who have gone before us who have um, endured so, so many things that we'll never know, right? Yeah. Because they just, they go through it and they, they don't burden us with it. They just want us to be positioned for better than they were. Um, so, so how did that continue to show up for you in your life? I mean, these, these foundations are so strong, but you are able to really use them as not just, oh, this is how I grew up, but how I continue to live my life. Yeah, well, well interestingly enough, I, I remember, um, you know, my, my dad saying, you know, be very mindful of who you spend time with. And, you know, they say we're an average of the five folks we spend the most time with, right, in terms of what we're able to accomplish. Um, but I, I love that point, too. I'm just going to interject right there. I think that's such a valuable point. I know... Um, my boyfriend, John, he'll say things like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so especially for younger adolescents or teens, they might not notice the significance of that yeah. and the, the power and influence of the people in the company that we keep yeah. for a variety of reasons. Yeah. So I just I, I really appreciate that you had that that mindset as well. Or your dad taught you that growing up. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, and it, it's incredibly important, and it doesn't stop, right? As adults, it's, you know, probably even more important for us to be highly selective. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but one thing that seemed almost oxymoronic was that there was a, a young man who would always, I would come home on the, on the bus when I, when I went to our house and not to my grandparents' house. I'd take the transit bus home, and there would often be this, uh, this boy that was about my age, he was a year older, um, that he would be coming home in a police cruiser. And I'm just like, oh, that's one, that must be one of those guys that, you know, my parents are saying, be careful who you hang around. Don't be around people who get in trouble. And then we're getting ready. Um, my dad was driving me to my soccer practice. And here comes the young man that always is coming home in a police car and he's getting into our car. So I didn't know, like, I'm like, am I supposed to like, not have conversation? This is awkward. And I didn't realize until like long after. So I did have conversation with him sure. um, eventually. And um, I didn't realize until years later that he didn't have a, a dad. And mm-hmm. he actually came up to my dad and, and thanked him for believing in him and for buying his soccer shoes and for wow. paying for his soccer registration and this is one we didn't have like oh. there's a lot of things we didn't have um but uh yeah it's just so interesting in hindsight how the dots connect um because again that was a, a testament um to just understanding that you're you're not in it on your own and sometimes people who are um demonstrating behaviors that that aren't in alignment with what we would want for everyone sometimes it's they have other things happening in life you never know what's going on with someone so i know you had a big major life turning point yeah where all this foundation was put into deep 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 practice so thank you in advance for sharing your courage and sharing your story so please tell our listeners your your story of when your life really began to change yeah so there there were a number of um, what I call moments of truth where, um, you know, you have an opportunity to, you know, I say stand up and make a play or fall down and make an excuse. Mm-hmm. And one of those things, and, and I, 
I, I'm a firm believer that life is all about perspective. Um, so, you know, I, I was working in corporate America. I was uh, serving as an, working as an IT consultant in downtown Chicago. I had made it out of public housing, you know, first to graduate with a post-grad degree in my family. And I felt Congratulations like- Congratulations on that. That's huge. It's awesome. Um, thank you. And, um, you know, I felt like I was doing something of significance, but I still felt like something was missing. And that missing piece was that service piece. The thing that my parents, you know, and grandparents always talked about um, in terms of raising the bar, but then making sure you raise the floor so that more people could reach the bar. So I love so, that. I, yeah. I love that. Raising the bar, but also raising the floor so more people can reach the bar. I've never heard it described exactly like that. And that's really beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> so, so, you know, I felt like that was missing for me. Um, the opportunity to serve. So I started investigating, like, how could I give back? And um, as I was doing that, I had just graduated from college. I was working as an IT professional for about four months, and I got a call from one of the professional football teams in Canada, the Canadian mm -hmm. Football League, and they said, are you still interested in playing football? And I said, do your football players, like, do things in community that make a difference? And the team that was on the phone said, Absolutely, they do. And um, if you make this team, you know, you can do the same. So I took a leave of absence uh, from my workplace, went back to Canada to serve, and football was the platform. Hmm. So as soon as I made the team, I got immediately involved in service. I was working uh, with police, training police and racial sensitivity. I was working with sick kids, um, refugee families, uh, newcomers, and um, just trying to do what I could, trying to figure out where my sweet spot was in terms of the service piece. I knew I wanted to serve. I didn't know it how. It really sounds like that service piece was a driving force for you and so many things you did. Yes. Yeah, it was. Because there are a lot of things that, you know, I realized that I had access to that if it weren't for somebody seeing something in me and reaching out, I wouldn't have had such yeah. access. Um, so, you know, it's not good enough to just achieve and be like, okay, good, I've arrived. What can you do to help other people? Right. So, right. Um, so as I was, you know, playing football and actively involved in community, um, I kept serving for a number of years. I played three seasons with the Toronto Argonauts of the Canadian Football League, then signed a contract deal with another team, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and um, was playing there, finished one year, <clears throat> still active in community. Um, and uh, was going into uh, my contract extension year. I just signed a contract extension, was excited to go out and celebrate with my teammates. And uh, when I got to the carpool location where we were meeting up to go downtown Toronto to celebrate, I, I was the first to arrive. I got there, I was excited, I had music playing, I stepped outside my car, I was dancing a little bit, and then I look over and I see two guys walking towards me. Um, and their demeanor was a little bit off. Like they seemed like really serious. And then I saw like a, something shiny and mm -hmm. I was like, hmm. And your intuition uh, was telling you something wasn't right. Something was, yeah. Something was up. Um, and they, you know, they came up on me and, and, and one of them threatened to shoot me in the head and they actually grabbed me and they were trying to wrestle me to the ground and they were beating me and punching me and kicking me. Um, Wow. And until the skin on my head split and I was face down on the pavement, and all I could think was, I can't believe I'm going to die like this. Mm. And, and the, the, other, the other thing that was really top of mind for me was the fact that I always wanted to be a, um, blessed to be a, a, a dad. Mm. I wanted to be present if I were ever a dad because... I, was, I didn't grow up around my dad because he was always, yeah. you know, he was working to provide. And I love him for that. We're a lot closer now than we were back then. But he well, you had great respect for it. You missed him. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and he wasn't close with his dad um, because of some things that happened when my, my grandmother passed when my dad was in the fifth grade. And, and so they, they had some challenges. So I wanted to break that cycle and be present. So at the time of the assault, um, we had a one-year-old son, Dante, 
and my wife was pregnant with our second oh child. Oh my goodness. And um, here I am, I'm being, being beaten and I'm thinking, God, don't let me die like this. Mm. I, I haven't even taught him how to tie his laces yet. There's all these things that I had dreamt about doing as a dad. And all of a sudden, it felt like all of those things were going to be gone. Wow. And um, I was just, yeah, it was a pretty surreal uh, experience. I, so I was beaten and beaten um, till I'm on the pavement. I feel my, the blood running out of my face and other parts of my body. And, and I, it was... I just thought that my life was over. Um, I, 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 no, the, as you as you tell this story, and you know, it's I can even see in your face just how much, even now, as even as you tell it, yeah. you become very present in that moment. Yeah, yeah, it was very it was very surreal. I'm so sorry you had to go through something so awfully traumatic. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, so journeying through though one of the things so the assault ended up ending my football career i was badly concussed i couldn't pass my physicals but the bigger challenge was that the assault actually happened at the hands of two corrupt undercover police officers who worked for for the police force that i was a spokesperson of the same force that i you know trained wow. sensitivity and went into schools with their officers I had a lot of friends, still have a lot of friends on the force. So when when did they realized, know who you were from those trainings? I I don't think so. Um, I don't think they know they knew who I was um, because it was more than the train. Like the chief and some of like the top brass will come to my football games. Wow. Like, was at my was the chief was at my wedding. I have family members that weren't at my wedding. Right. Wow. When, meet and talk about community things yeah. so when when it happened i because i know so many good hearted community minded service oriented police officers i knew that one of them was going to stand up and say something because that's just who they are right that's who, that's what we that's what we do we stand up for the right thing so i knew that one of them was going to stand up and say something you know until until no one did wow uh, was because they were they were afraid. So in in private, they would say, you know, I wish I could say something. Um, so I'd say, so say something then. And they'd say, but I, I can't because I'm just one person and the system is so big. Wow. And, and there is a such thing as, you know, um, yeah, things happen out there in the field. Mm -hmm. um, they were concerned about if they would actually stand up well, they're worried for their own safety, I'm sure, in their careers and their families and all the trickle line down that it affects, for sure. 100%. So, um, so that ended your football career. It ended my football career, and it challenged everything that I'd cut. The, the whole reason why I was playing football was so I could serve, but the places that I was serving, a number of them called me and they said, hey, man, listen, we, Orlando, we heard about what you're going through, and we wish you all the best, but, uh, you know, um, don't ever come back here. And, wow. and let me tell you why, because this, this is a part that, so when they realized that I was their spokesperson and I did a lot of work, I was actively involved uh, in bridging community and police, um, they took me to jail and wouldn't let me speak to anybody um, because they, well, well what they, they took me to jail, wouldn't let me talk to anyone, and then they started calling around to who try to- Who was they? When you say they took you to jail, who was they? The, the two uh, corrupt undercover officers. Okay. Right, so they take me to jail. They don't let me call anyone. And then they start calling other officers, asking them if they've got any dirt on this Orlando Bond guy. So some of the officers are friends of mine, and they're like, you mean the guy that was just in a school with us? The, or, you know, the guy whose game we went to? Or, like, what's going on? And they wouldn't, when those two officers wouldn't answer the question, what's going on, why are you asking? Um, they started call. some of my friends started calling each other and saying something's up. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, uh, when they realized, when the officers uh, realized that I was um, a spokesperson, a huge cover-up began. So they, because they knew I was assaulted and they put me in jail, they went back to the scene and planted drugs by my car 
and took pictures of the drugs and then said that when they came to arrest me for the drugs, I started fighting them, which resulted in my face and body being beaten the way it was. Wow. Um, so they literally assaulted you and then dragged you right to jail after the assault? Yes. They assaulted and then went me. back and planted all of that at the scene of the, at the scene. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So You're I was so actually, corrupt. I, I was so like, so I'm, I don't know any of this is happening. All I know is that I'm in the jail cell and they're not letting me call anyone. Right. They're, they keep denying me my phone call. Cause I was just going to call, I was going to call the chief. Um, but they wouldn't let me call anyone. So, um, but hours pass and I hear them, you know, releasing some other people and asking these other folks how they're getting home. So I'm thinking, okay, Maybe they're never going to give me my call, but they're going to come and eventually ask me how I'm getting. It. So um, I see a At gentleman. At that point, how was, your, how was your physical health? I mean, you said you were badly concussed. Your, your, your head had split open. Had you had any medical care at that point? No, no medical attention. Um, it, was, it was bad. It was, it was, it was really bad. I might hit, my head was, and face were swollen. It was, it was crazy. Um, and, uh, so I asked a gentleman, and again, this is like hours have passed. And I asked one of the officers who are walking past myself, I said, when do I get to go home? Cause I hear these other folks, um, being released and they're asking them how they're getting home. So I said, when do I get to go home? And he says, home, <laughs> you're not going home. You have a bail hearing. Wow. And I said, a bail hearing for what? And, he, and that's when he said, well, don't you know what you've been charged with? You've been charged with assaulting a police officer and possession of a controlled substance. So I still didn't believe, because I'm like, that's ludicrous. That's how could- it sounds completely preposterous for yeah, who you were absolutely. and what your character was and who everyone in the community knew you to be. Well, I'm, I'm battling to like bridge the gap between community and police. Like that's, that's what I'm, that's my job. Like that's how yeah. I'm working hard for And I'm taking heat from the community for doing that because some folks are like, why are you helping them? You know how they treat us. They don't treat us like regular citizens. Why are you trying to help them? And I, I'd say, well, if I see something that's, that could be better, I'm, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to put my hand up and say, what can I do? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. Um, so it was a, a, yeah, it was a real challenge to, to say the least. Um, so anyhow, he says, you know, don't you know you've been, arrested for and then tells me possession of a controlled substance and assaulting a police. And I didn't believe him. I didn't believe him until they opened my jail cell up the next morning and handcuffed me to three other guys to take us to the courthouse. Wow. Right. So that's when I realized that it was for real. Um, and, uh, you know, we go, I, I get released on bail, post bail. I didn't have any other interactions um, with, with police services. All my interactions had been around building community. Um, so, yeah, so all my way... You were, as, as I, I mean, I could assume a lot of this, but what were you feeling in those moments or those, that first day in the, that jail cell or being handcuffed to other people being dragged off to the court? What was going through your head? What was going through your body? What was going through your heart? I was... Uh, my head... I was shocked i was in disbelief i was yeah. like this, this can't be real like this can't be happening um i'm the spokesperson i was actually a special guest in the holding cell underneath the courthouse i was a special guest of a judge and a superintendent of police walking through that space wow um, and now i'm being detained in that space it was like there's so many layers of irony it was just absolutely unbelievable yeah so my in my body my body was beaten um you know in my heart i was just i was kind of searching like for what's real like what's real in this mm -hmm. how how is this even possible that something like this could happen and um yeah, so, you know, I, uh, I got to, here. so I, we post bail, we're on our way to the hospital, I called the chief, because this is my first opportunity to make a phone call, I called the chief, I called the mayor, I called uh, the head coach of uh, one of the teams that I had played for, 
The chief didn't pick up. The mayor answered, and I told her we were on our way to the hospital. Um, my former coach, I left a message for him. Um, and when I got to the hospital, um, you know, the nurse comes in and she looks at me. She's looking at my injuries and she says, what happened to you? And I, I looked at my wife and I'm like, there's no way she's going to believe me. So I said to the nurse, <clears throat> I got jumped. And the nurse says, just, she's looking down at her clipboard, filling something out. She says, oh, by who, the police? And she's just filling it in. It was so casual, so nonchalant that I was wow. I said, why would you say that? Like, why is that the first thing out of, your, out of your mouth? And she says, oh, because I see it often, but usually it's not. Like, usually it's teenagers or newcomers or people who don't speak English well. So mm -hmm. you don't really fit that bill. So that bill, so, you know, that's a little bit strange. And, but the interesting thing was when she named those three groups, those three groups happened to be three groups that I was working with at that time in community. So immediately my thought went to, well, what if this was Jose's dad who just came um, from Mexico? Or what, if, what if this was, you know, DeAndre who, who was, you know, 19 years old? Or what if this was Susan, right? So all these thoughts came right. to my thought. If this was any one of the families that we were working with, what chance would they have in this scenario? Um, and then, like, the thing was in the courtroom, you know, imagine this officer comes in puts his hand on the bible takes the oath to tell the truth looks at the judge then looks at me and he says looks back at the judge and he says your honor he's six foot two and 235 pounds and he's trained to hurt people in my 17 years on this force i've never been in such fear for my life or my partner's life and i'm looking at him like how could you say that Right, so I, I projected him saying that ex those exact things about one of the young people we were serving or one of the newcomer families, and I'm thinking they wouldn't have a chance. Yeah. And in that moment, I thought, this isn't even about me, right? This is bigger than me. Like, this is about giving hope to people who may be in situations where they feel like they shouldn't have any hope. So, so you know, it was it was very surreal, but... I realized that it wasn't about me. Now, the mayor came to the hospital before I even got seen by the doctor. And she looked at me and said, what happened? And I told her, and she said, but didn't they know who you are? And and I, I said, Madam Mayor, this is not supposed to happen to anyone. Right? right. It, it, it doesn't matter, like, position or status. And she was like, you know what, you're right. Um, but, you know, it was this crazy journey that, that we were on, you know, having to. Now, I couldn't play football. Uh, so I lost that job. Um, I couldn't, I was challenged to go serve in the places that I had come back to serve at because they didn't want this case and all the stuff that came with it coming into their space. Right. And they it really shifted said, the whole energy on that. 100%. So, so it was a, was a real challenge. Um, but anyhow, I'll go into court and just, you know, hoping and praying for the truth. So I'm sitting in the courtroom and listening to the officer lie and say how, you know, I assaulted him and my, my lawyer was like, so my client, you mentioned he's six foot two, 235 pounds, and you say that he sucker punched you in the face. Where is the markings on your face that would, and there were none. <laughs> right? And right. he's like, are there markings anywhere? Um, that would suggest what, what, you're, what you're saying to be the truth. So um, it was a really yeah, surreal experience where when I'm listening to him share, all I could think was, what could have happened to him to allow him the capacity to do that to somebody else? Like, what wow. kind of pain must he have been through to allow him to know that by saying what he's saying, like, you could be sending somebody to prison that you know is innocent. What could you have been through to allow you the capacity to do that? I'm so impressed with that ability that in that moment, when it would have been the most common thing for anyone to sit there and say, why me? Why this? What did I do to deserve this? And be really stuck on a negative inward spiral. But for you to have the ability to step outside of yourself in that moment and be curious, and it sounds almost like with compassion for this other person who assaulted you. Yeah. 
and to be able to say, what, what could have gone on in his life that allowed him to do this to me? Yeah. It's such an opposite reaction or response that I think many people would have. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I didn't, it was just how we're not wired to do that to each other. Like we weren't built to tear each other down like yeah. that and to try to destroy each other. So all I could think was something had to have happened um, to allow that capacity. So, and in that moment, I started to, you know, to pray for him. Our family, when we're under stress, um, when we, we're, we're giving thanks or seeking energy from a, a higher power, I know people do different things. We pray. And I, I like you mentioned, I, I actually felt such deep sorrow for him hmm. because I was just like, man, like what could have happened? I, I was just like, I can't even imagine what could bring someone to that place to do that to somebody else. So I was yeah. praying for him to get the healing that he needed and for the truth to come out. And what some would consider to be a strange twist of events, we got six weeks before the verdict and um, one of the arresting officers was himself arrested for trafficking cocaine. They found 17 kilos of cocaine at his house. And um, so he gets arrested for trafficking cocaine. I've learned of this. It wasn't public, made public yet. Um, but I learned because of the gentleman who was covering our case from the newspaper said, it was also a friend of ours. And he said, this is insane. I've never heard anything like this. It just doesn't happen. Because the, the police service that charged him is the equivalent of like FBI. That okay. is the highest level of policing in the country which is the only level of policing that would, that could really charge him, right? Otherwise it would be one of his peers and that would, wouldn't be um, a good career move. Um, so, you know, so that happens. And then- um, how, did that, how did that turn of events affect you in that moment of being six weeks away from verdict? Well, well I was just like, wow, this is, Unbelievable. Talk about irony some more. Yeah. But everything had been, everything up until that point had been unbelievable, right? Like, I was living, I felt like I was living in a movie. I felt like I was actually watching my life happen because it just didn't seem like it was uh, for real. Yeah. And, um, you know, our my wife did give birth to our son. His name is Justice because our prayer was that we would have justice through this whole process. Um, so um, That's beautiful, by the way. Yeah, thank you. And, and yeah, there's just so much irony. Um, so, you know, so he gets arrested. Then the, the, the DA's office called, not knowing that we know about the charges. And they offered, they said, you know what? You do such amazing work in the community and everyone knows that. And, you know, we don't want you to have to go through this court stuff because it's so messy. So why don't you just let us drop the charges? And everyone could just be happy. And I said, absolutely not. Wow. This isn't about being happy. This is about principle. And I'd rather be wrongfully convicted versus striking a deal on that premise. Now, my lawyer thought I was crazy. <laughs> most people probably would think you were crazy for that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but for I most people, that's probably what they would have been praying for on some right. level, right? Right. I hear you. But I, I, I wanted it to be unequivocal. I didn't want... Like, let's say the case got thrown out and then folks are like, well, you know, was he guilty? Was he not guilty? You know, athletes, you know, sometimes they get away with things. So I didn't want there to be any doubt. I'd rather there be, you know, just it to be crystal clear. And I was willing to risk whatever uh, for that. Um, but I also it's had such a reflection. I have to say, it's just such a reflection of your your strong principles and morals and values for you to turn down the DA's offer. Yeah. Well, I I just I felt like we had to, you know, and uh, because I I knew that there would be some time in the future where people are going to be faced with something, and you know you could turn and and. and run or you could stand up and even though it may feel like you're standing alone that's okay sometimes if you're standing for the right thing right that's the best way to to journey forward to, even yeah. if you're journeying by yourself at first it, and it may feel lonely but there are others who share your heart and by you journeying that way it gives them permission 
to also stand tall in their own journey. I love right? that. So, so I was just like, we have to do this. Um, so, you know, the officer, when he was charged, um, people, and, and I was subsequently acquitted. Uh, they, so they asked us to let them drop the charge. We said no. They then asked the judge. The judge said no. He won't let them drop the charge and then actually um, prepared his judgment early. And uh, I was acquitted. And, um, you know, they, um, people came and they wanted to celebrate. They're like, yes, you know, you, you're acquitted. And the officers in charge, you got convicted and sent to, to go to prison for five years. Let's celebrate. And I said, absolutely not. We will not celebrate someone else's pain because that gentleman, he's a, like, he's a dad just like I am. I can't celebrate him going off to prison and leaving his family. Like, I'm not, I'm not good with that. So um, when I said what we will commit to doing is, is standing tall even when we're, we have to stand alone and encourage others to stand tall in their own journey and in their own stories so that we could give people permission, regardless of where they're from or what they've been through, to know that those experiences aren't going to be the end game. They're just life experiences, right? And you could get through it. And uh, so that, that was our commitment. And, and we've been doing all that we can to stand tall and to empower and equip corporate leaders, teams, youth to do the same. It's, it's really amazing. I find your story so inspiring because it's so easy to take any negative life experience, right? And that can range from something small to something big, depending on how someone's going to identify their relationship to what's gone on in their lives. Love but that. they can use that as a moment of defining themselves and then get stuck in that definition and not do anything about it. Yeah. And as a therapist, I, I see this, right? I see, and, and it's to no judgment. Am I saying this? It's just an observation. This is so easy to have happen, to get stuck in their story, yeah. to get stuck in fear or anxiety or anger, right? I mean, there's so many things to get stuck on. And I find it just so beautiful to take the foundations of which in which you were raised, but then actually walk the walk and talk the talk and continue to be in your mission of service. Yeah. And how can I now use this to inspire others to stand up, to be on their journey, to live in their convictions, to not celebrate someone else's pain, to have the compassion of, yeah, this man is still a father. He still is a soul. He still has a beating heart. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that, I, that we firmly believe is that we're all on our own. We're all on our own journeys, right? Just like how you and I met, and, and my life will never be the same because of that. You don't know when you interact with someone and how they, what they project on you or at you, you don't know how your response mm -hmm. can be the thing that serves as a catalyst for them. And they may not stop in that moment and say, wow, this is really a transformative moment for me. Right. right. It may not be until they reflect if they do. And it's not our job to say one day that they'll reflect. Our job is sure. to show up for others in a way that allows them at some point down the line to reflect on that interaction and what it meant for them in a positive way. Right. So you just, you, you never know. You never know. How do you, what, I mean, we talked earlier a little bit about forgiveness. How yes. easy was it for you to continue to practice this? And did you forgive? Yeah, I actually, I wrote a letter of forgiveness to the officers where I, you know, I, I thank them for the um, for the perspective that I gave through the process because it actually, I feel like it made me a better father mm -hmm. and a better husband and, and just a, a better person. Um, because, you know, not that I wasn't present before, but the level of presence um, increased significantly. And those moments that, like, you know, I may have taken for granted. I don't take anything for granted. Um, I don't take any interaction, any meeting for granted um, because I, I know how fleeting, you know, life can be. Yeah. 
you know, and, and, and I know how powerful these moments can be for, for, for us if we actually stop and just honor one another, right? Stop and, and look for reasons to celebrate within the person with whom you're interacting. Even though sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes it's going to be challenged. Sometimes it's more work than other times, but that's okay, right? There's so much for us to be grateful for, um, even when times are dark. So It's so true. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's these practices of gratitude, of compassion, of being present, of being aware. I mean, this is what I fully and wholeheartedly believe in and what I'm building not only my career, but my life around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are like, okay, but give me the formula. Like, what do I do? Like, tell me just what to do. And then I'll just do it. It's like, but that's just it. It's just that simple. Right. You know, sometimes we want to overcomplicate a process and think it has to be esoteric for it to be impactful or transformative. Right. And yet, yeah, being grateful can do a lot. Yeah. Just being present and noticing as you wander off, what am I missing? Right. And that's, you know, we can't be present 100% of the time. As I sit here and talk to you, I'm not paying attention to my kids right now. That's okay. Yeah. I'm here present with you. You know, so like we get stuck on, I can't be present in everything at one time, right. but we can recognize when I'm with someone in an interaction and I'm not being present within that moment, yes. I have an opportunity to decide if I want to show up in a different way in my life. And most yeah. people go through just on autopilot and never get that wake up call to say, Hey, how do you want to choose to continue to live your life? And you would already been doing that in your work of service and it's amazing that this didn't knock you off and make you bitter and ungrateful and 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 easy to just to be angry and say fuck it why should i keep doing all this work when there's still bad stuff happening in the world well yeah. that's even more reason to continue to do the work of service right you said it you said it if anything it was a galva it had a galvanizing effect to say and this is why the work is needed and why it's needed now more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it that, you, that you're that you doing now? So clearly you're no longer playing football. And uh, no you're continuing to spread football. this work of yeah. positivity and power of transformation and forgiveness. So yeah. it, it not to, you know, make it sound like everything um, happens for a reason in a cliche-ish sort of way. But how are you, what, what are you doing now? And how are you using your experience to inspire others aside from sharing your story on people's podcasts like mine? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I speak corporately. So I, I work with, with companies, uh, a lot of mostly companies that have teams of, of people. Um, I, I talk about forgiveness as a high performance tool. Mm. I talk about team building and, and, uh, and resilience. <laughs> Um, in a sense of, you know, leveraging all that you have and all of your person um, to get off the sidelines of life and be a game changer for somebody else. I love that. Yeah. And as an athlete, that's a great analogy for you to have. Yeah, because, uh, you know, a lot of the times, like, we'll watch, watch things from the sidelines and say, well, you know, maybe if that had happened, I would, you know, we don't have time. Like, our kids don't have time. Our communities don't have time. Our Countries don't have time for us to play yeah. the game. For us. I know, we have to go, right? Because there are people who are giving up hope and then they act out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like we're behind, right? I feel like, we, like there's, there's such a need right now that, that we have to go. So I work corporately um, with, with corporate groups um, and do keynotes and workshops. And I also uh, have a very great deep passion for leadership and, and, and learning and, and founded a youth leadership charity that, uh, you know, inspires young people to be game changers for others. So the charity goes in schools and, you know, works with young people, takes them out into the community, feeds homeless, builds houses for people who don't have does outreach so that the young people, regardless of their circumstance, can see their ability to actually contribute and make a difference today with what they have, regardless of what it is that they have. 
It's amazing. It's, it's really inspiring. And I'm wondering if you can maybe give some tools if someone's listening right now who has struggled with forgiveness with someone or some circumstance in their life. Could you maybe give some guidelines on how to deepen a forgiveness practice to a point where it actually releases yeah. that pressure and those shackles? Because without forgiveness, we're the ones who we stay stuck in suffering, right? Oh, stuck. So stuck. So I, I think about it like this. Um, I, you know, imagine playing on monkey bars, right? And, and a number of us used to play on monkey bars. As kids, we used to play tag at the park on monkey bars. Imagine trying to, so you're on one end of the monkey bars. You're, what, for all the things for what you've been designed, Jory, like the things that only you could bring to fruition, await you on the opposite end, right? You can't get there while holding on to the anger bar. Mm. You can't get there while holding on to the resentment bar, to the he said, I can't believe she did this to me bar. We can't, you can't get to what you've been designed for until we learn to let go. And, and, and when we let go, it's not you know condoning the thing that has happened to us. It's not you know, waiting for the person to say you know, sorry or anything like that. It's you letting go and acknowledging that you have the power to move forward because they're on their journey and you're on your own journey, right? So, you know, when I wrote the letter of forgiveness, I actually didn't realize how much of a burden would be released from my shoulders in writing. Yeah. It. And uh, because it, it took, I was just like, you know, I just wanted them to know that I wasn't holding, I wasn't harboring any ill will, but I needed to say it though. I needed to put yeah. it in writing. And, well, it makes it more of an intention versus just thinking it. Yes, it's a commitment. By, by, by putting it out there, it's a commitment to, you know, actually enacting this belief system rather than just thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, forgive them, let it go, move on. Right. right. It becomes tangible. It, it was very tangible. And, um, you know, so, so that, was, that, was very, that was a very powerful exercise, which... It, for me, it wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't my intention. I was actually at a, a, a workshop about uh, business and they said, what do you need to let go of so you can step fully into your, into what your possibilities are? Who do you need to forgive? And I'm like, forgive? I don't need to forgive anybody, man. What is this? You know, like, I, give me the marketing tactics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, the lady beside me was like, wow, I haven't spoken to my brother in eight years because of what he said at my wedding. And I was like, Really? And then I started thinking, well, what if I could say, because I was going through the court case at this time, and I couldn't speak in court. Mm. So, so I wanted to just let them know how I was feeling, that I wasn't harboring any ill will against them. I actually feel sorry for them for what has brought them to this point. Um, so I just wrote what I wanted to say, but felt that I couldn't. Yeah. And, um, you know, after writing it, folks were asking me, so what did they say when you gave it to them? Well, I didn't even give it to them for a while. I was just, after I wrote it, I was good. That's and, almost enough, right? That's a huge release just to actually get it out of your head, out of your body and onto paper. And you no longer are carrying it. Yes. And by doing so, you allowed yourself to observe it in a different way, right? When, you, when it was inside of you, it's hard to differentiate. You become so fused with those thoughts and emotions, but now you're in observation of them, and then you can just see them for what they are. They don't define you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it allows you to, to kind of look at it almost like from a third-party type of mm -hmm. view and acknowledge it for it being a part of your journey and not you. It's not you. It's, an, it's just an experience. I, the it's something you went through. Yeah, that's it. And it doesn't have to define anything in terms of what's possible going forward. You still have a choice in the process. Well, and the other thing, too, I'm a big fan of creating ritual. Yep. And I think when we create ritual, we are actively taking part in an intention setting. And I, um, I guide this with some clients, and I do an end of the year workshop right before New Year's every year. I'm not a fan of New Year's resolutions. I think that's right. kind of bullshit. If you want to make change, do it now. Don't wait for a particular totally. day of the year. Yeah. But I do like the ritual around it becoming a new year as an opportunity to let go of what you no longer want to carry. Yeah. 
Right. And, you know, so I do a let your shit go workshop, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a creating ritual around writing and then burning. Yeah. We no longer want to carry. So we, you know, we write it down and then we let it go. And that release is hugely freeing. Yeah. Yeah. I it's had a very, very powerful. And, yeah. you know, to just create ritual around something makes it, um, more of a stepping stone like it again it becomes that tangible evidence of i am consciously choosing to do this and then yeah. doing it yeah interesting that you say that because i had a friend suggest that she said take it to a place that is like special to you a place that is like home for you and then just burn it yeah and, and there was a, a process of so because we're you know um spiritual or what have you um putting it like I, I felt like I had released it already, but the the process of taking it um back home and and burning it and watching the ashes rise up was just like I'm giving it up. Yeah. I, I like I'm good. Like I, I don't have to own it. Um it, it, it was a powerful exercise. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you one of my favorite exercises as we wrap this up in the next few moments. But I've seen you take a drink from your water bottle. So if anyone's listening out there, they can participate along. So I invite you. This is an exercise to show this power. So hold up your cup. And if I were to say to you, how much does it weigh? What would you say? A pound and a half. Okay. So hold it all the way up. So you're not resting on anything. So if it's pound and a half. Is it heavy? No. No. If you had to hold it for the next five minutes, would it be heavy? Mm, no, not really. It'd be after a while. It'd be fatiguing. Okay. What if you had to hold it for the next three hours? Would this cup become heavy? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we do this, right? We go through life holding on to things, yeah. and the longer we hold on to it, the heavier it is to carry. But we walk around with our life and we're like, this is so heavy. This is so heavy. Why me? Why did this happen? Why this? And we yeah. forget that we have some option yeah. to put the cup down. Yeah. And when we put the cup down, we are releasing the weight from carrying it. And I'm not denying or resisting or ignoring the cup. I've simply shifted my relationship to the cup. It no longer has the same weight to it when I set it down. Right. And that to me is a great practice in forgiveness and letting go. Yeah. Love it. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I find you so inspiring. And I know that the work you continue to do is in service of all the foundations in which um, not only were you raised, but you continue to embody. And I know that you're making huge impact on all the lives that you are touching um, with your story and with you showing up in, in just all the work that you're doing, whether it's with the youth or in corporate world. Thank you for doing what you're doing and, and sharing not only your time with me, but your, your inspiration. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you. And thank you for your leadership. All right. Well, um, you guys can get access to any of Orlando's information and it'll have any special links for anyone who wants to follow him or find him online or learn more about his uh, foundation he set up for youth leadership. And I hope our, cross, our paths cross again soon. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot -E -E com.